for deck building for the Lord of the Rings trading card game, a deck must be at least 60 cards in number. That is the smallest size you can use. Beyond that, there is no specific maximum. So if you wanted to build a deck with a thousand cards, you could go for it. Um, maybe someone has done that before. Generally, it is strategically beneficial to pare down your deck to as small a size as you can get it while still having the good cards that you need for your deck's specific strategy so that you have a better chance of drawing into those cards as the game goes on. However, there are strategies which benefit from having a large card pool to draw from. Secondly, because in this game, on your turn, you play as the Free Peoples, and then in your opponent's turn, you play as the Shadow Side, it is a rule that you have to build your deck with equal parts Free Peoples cards and Shadow cards. That is to say, the number of Free Peoples cards in your deck has to be exactly equal to the number of Shadow cards in your deck, and thus vice versa. So, in the minimum deck size of 60 cards, you would have 30 Free Peoples cards and 30 Shadow cards. And it may be worth mentioning here that while we talk about the deck minimum, that number does not include those cards which are in your adventure path. That is to say, your sights, which is a discussion for later. Furthermore, in that 60 card total, or whatever number you're going to have, Frodo, or your ring bearer, and the ring do not count against your card total, and thus also do not count towards the number of free people's cards specifically in your deck. Frodo is, of course, a free people's companion. The ring is not a shadow card or a free people's card, but either way, neither the ring nor the ring bearer count towards your free people's deck total nor towards the deck total itself. On that note, the next rule. Your deck must include a ring bearer. In the first and second block, this will naturally be Frodo. He is the only ring bearer available to you through series one through eight. And then your deck must also include some version of the one ring. Now, beyond your ring bearer and your ring, your free people side doesn't technically have to have any other companions with it, although basically any deck strategy will require, if it wants to be successful, having other companions with Frodo. But this brings us into two further considerations. One is that each deck is limited to four copies of any one given card. Four dagger strikes, for Hobbit Stealth, for Uric Ragers, the cap is at four. As it relates to companions, as we were just talking about a moment ago, the limit of four copies of any one given card applies to cards with unique names but different subtitles as well. If I want to have four copies of Aragorn in my deck, Aragorn is the title of all versions of Aragorn, and there are many different versions that you can use, but they all have the same main title, which is Aragorn. So I can only have four copies of Aragorn, no matter which version those Aragorns are. So I could have one copy of Aragorn King in Exile, one copy of Aragorn Ranger of the North, and two copies of Aragorn Heir to the White City, and that would be the four card limit for Aragorn. This also includes unique copies of minion cards, which have different subtitles, as you would see, for example, with the Nazgul. The second note to make about companions is maybe less of a deck building rule and more of a deck playing rule, but it certainly factors into your decision about deck building, which is you may only have nine companions total in play and in the dead pile at any given time. 
So if you want to build an entire free people side of just companions, you absolutely can. But once you reach that point where you add up your companions in the dead pile and in play in your fellowship and it's nine, you may no longer play any further companions. So that sets a a natural limit on how much you want to put into your deck. There are certain situations where you may find it advantageous to put more than nine companions in the deck so that you feel you can build into that nine companion limit as quick as possible. But again, once you reach that, there it goes. So that's basically it for the skeleton of your deck building. You got to have a ring bearer, uh, most of the time Frodo, and a ring. You have to have equal numbers of free people's cards and shadow cards. Your deck has to be at least 60 cards total. And you can't have any more than four copies of the same named card. But then the question is, what cards can I put into my deck? So let's talk really quickly about blocks and formats. The game came out as the movies were coming out. So the Fellowship of the Ring was released maybe a month or two before the Fellowship of the Ring was released in theaters. And then soon after the Minds of Moria expansion came out and then the Realm of the Elf Lords expansion came out. Those three series specifically tell the story of the Fellowship of the Ring within the Lord of the Rings. So those three series form a specific block. So too, series four, five, and six, the two towers, Battle of Helm's Deep, and Ends of Fangorn, all tell the story specifically of the two towers. And then series seven, eight, and ten, which are the Return of the King, Siege of Gondor, and Mount Doom, all tell the story of Return of the King. Series 9, Reflections, gave a glimpse of what was about to come the next year. And then, yes, from Series 11 and onwards, the story of the game is more generic. Characters, events, conditions, and sites are pulled from all three different installments of the story and function rather interchangeably. In fact, the adventure path from series 11 onwards can be pulled from different locations throughout the story. If the game was being produced still by Decipher, we may not have to worry so much about all of these details because the state of the game would be wherever we were right now, whatever was being produced. Of course, the game has been out of production for more than a decade at this point. It was a dream. Fans of the game have different parts, different stages of the game that really work for them. I'm a big fan of the Fellowship of the Ring block, for example. So let's get into that for a second. You start with Fellowship of the Ring, Minds of Moria, and Realms of the Elf Lords, series 1 through 3 all telling the story of the Fellowship of the Ring. You can choose, and the question is basically having you and your player group, you and your opponent, you and your uh, selection of other players, all decide together what part of the story you want to tell. Really, you, <laughs> you could do whatever you wanted as long as your player group agreed to it all. Now, if you want to play in Fellowship Block you know that your cards are going to come only from Series 1, 2, and 3. And that is a Fellowship Block game. Your sites, similarly, are going to be all from Series 1 through 3, and they're all going to be from the Fellowship of the Ring story. And thus, the adventure path is going to flow basically from the Shire, through Rivendell, into Moria, out to Lothlorien, down the Anduin River... And finally to Tolbrandir, Amonhen, etc. The Fellowship Block, where you build decks using cards from series 1 through 3, gives us a pattern for how to think of deck building moving forward. Your next option is to play a tower standard game, where you have to use the sites from series 4 through 6, which are all pulled from the second movie in the trilogy, 
but all your other cards can be from series 1 through 6. In other words, you now have two Towers cards available for your deck building, but you're also still allowed to reach backwards and mix in your favorite cards from series 1 through 3. Or, optionally, you can play just a literal Towers block game, in which you only use cards from series 4 through 6, period. Again, these are decisions you can make ahead of time with your player group. Then, the next available option is Movie Block, where you use the sites from series 7 through 10, which are pulled from the final movie of the trilogy, but all your other cards can be from series 1 through 10. So now, you're playing a Return of the King-based game, and now you have series 7 through 10 available to you, but you're still allowed to reach backwards and mix in your favorite cards from series 1 through 6. Or maybe your group would prefer using series 1 through 7 only, which is referred to as King Standard. At any rate, series 1 through 10, and those three main formats where you tell either the story of Fellowship of the Ring, or The Two Towers, or Return of the King, all of that represents a kind of first half of the game. From series 11 and onwards, cards were created from diverse points within the entire trilogy, and this plays out most significantly within the adventure path, the sites that you use. From series 11 onwards, the rules for which sites you bring with you change. Some of the features of the sites change, and as with the other cards, Sites are pulled from more diverse moments within the entire trilogy, so the sites from series 11 and onwards function only with other sites from series 11 and onwards. You have the option, of course, to still allow non-site cards, that is, every other kind of card, to be pulled from the series prior to series 11, the most open format in the game, called Expanded Format, allows for cards to be pulled from the entire span of the game's production. But still then, with the understanding that you'll be using sites from Series 11 and onwards. To go into detail on all of the commonly used formats would be tedious to listen to, but I think we can summarize all of this discussion on formats and blocks by recognizing three principles. One, Formats are thematically organized by choosing which movie you want to tell the story of. Fellowship, Towers, Return of the King, or, in some sense, all of the above. Two, the most concrete organizing force for your chosen format is which sites you're using in your adventure path. Fellowship games use sites from series 1 through 3, Towers games use sites from 4 through 6, King games use sites from 7 through 10, and Shadows and Onwards use sites from series 11 and onwards. And 3. In many formats, as you choose to make decks from later series, you can still build your deck with cards from the series which had come before. But... It is very unusual in the earlier formats, like a Fellowship Block game, to build your deck with cards from the series which follow after. In short, formats reflect various stages from the game's history, and your available card pool grows as you choose to revisit a point in time from later on in the game's history. If a version of Gandalf the Grey shows up in the Two Towers... That's fine. But if a version of Gandalf the White shows up in the Fellowship of the Ring, something strange is happening. That's a lot, but I will be sure to leave a link in the description of this video to the page on the TCG Wiki, which lays out all of the various formats in detail, and which you can review at your convenience. And finally, now that we've talked about formats, there's one more deck building rule to cover, which is your deck needs an adventure path. The adventure path is your set of chosen sites for a deck. 
your adventure path needs exactly nine different sites. In a fellowship block game, you need one site of each number. So you need a site one, you need a site two, a site three, a site four, a site five, six, seven, eight, and nine. All of these sites will need to be from the first three series of the game, the fellowship block. Notice that most site cards have two different numbers. The number on the left is the site number, which tells you how far along in the story your fellowship has gone. And then the number on the right is the shadow number, which tells you how much additional twilight to add to the twilight pool when your fellowship moves to that site. So in terms of having one site of each number in order from one to nine, we are referring to the site number on the left. For deck building rules, the shadow number on the right is irrelevant until you get to series 11, but it certainly is relevant for a deck building strategy. That is a different discussion. For a towers block game, once again, you need exactly nine sites with each site number from one to nine represented. And now, as we've discussed before, all of these sites will need to be pulled from series four through six. And for a Return of the King block game, yet again, you need exactly nine sites, with each site number from one to nine represented. And these sites will all need to be pulled from series seven through 10. Lastly, for a game in a format after Return of the King, Shadows and Onwards, the adventure path has to be made of exactly nine sites, pulled from series 11 and onwards. However, from this point on in the game, sites don't have site numbers, only shadow numbers. Therefore, you do not need to be concerned with having any specific numbered or chronological order to the sites in your adventure path. However, all nine sites must be different from one another, and as an added rule in these later formats, you can have no more than three sites in your adventure path with the same shadow number as one another. For example, you can only have up to three sites in your adventure path with a shadow number of zero. Stay tuned, and I'll walk through a couple example decks in just a moment. So here's an example of a two towers block and deck. We have 37 cards in a fellowship, not including Frodo, um, because Frodo doesn't count against your total. And then the ring is not considered a shadow or a fellowship card, so it doesn't count against your total either. Uh, we have to have a ring bearer, so there it is. Up, at till, up till this point in the game, Frodo is the only ring bearer available. Uh, there are multiple versions of him, so I've chosen this one because his ability triggers off of having many unbound companions around him, and this deck is full of them. But Frodo, generally speaking, is your only choice for a ring bearer in two towers. So there he is. I have only up to four copies of any card that I really want, because again, you can only have four copies of something in a deck. So I've got four of Boomed and Trumpeted, four Hobbit Appetite, four Stout and Sturdy, four There and Back Again, four Hobbit Swords. I also have four copies of Treebeard. There are, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, like copies of companion cards in this deck. And then Frodo, although he doesn't count against the total, um, we sort of think of that as fifteen. I mentioned earlier that you can only have nine companions at once out there in your fellowship and then in your dead pile. So in the story of the game, you can only have had nine companions total, either going with Frodo or having um, died along the way. So what's going on here? Well, one, Treebeard, I have four copies of Treebeard. So he's gonna be just one of those nine companions. Similarly, I have three copies of Skinbark, so he's only gonna be like one companion when he's out. But if we do count it up as individual companions specifically, then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10 with Sam here. I don't know if I counted him earlier. Um, 
So, what happens? Well, even though you can only have nine companions in your fellowship and in your dead pile at a time, you can still have as many companions as you want in your discard pile. So, for one thing, you can discard companions during the regroup phase as a matter of reconciliation. You can also discard companions during the fellowship phase if you have a copy of that companion out in play already in order to heal a wound off of that companion. Treebeard is a character I want to draw quickly in this game. Uh, he's very important. He gives me damage bonuses. He has 12 strength. So I want those four copies. And then because he's exerting to give um, damage bonuses to Ents, it's also helpful to have those extra copies anyways to heal him during the fellowship phase so he can keep using that ability. Skinbark, it's good to have extra copies just so I draw him into him. And then there's companion overload here because these two you can't play until you spot two end companions. Fortunately, uh, Quickbeam is already there in our starting fellowship, but that still means I need to draw either Lindenroot or one of these seven copies of Treebeard and Skinbark together uh, to play down before I can play one of these two. And it's just really hard having these stuck in your hand. I also have A Wizard is Never Late to add some redundancy just to give myself another chance to draw a companion, especially if I don't have Treebeard out there yet. And then again, if I draw into extra companions and there's not space for them, they just go into the discard pile. And that's safe, that's fine. So for deck building purposes, you can have many more than nine companions, and certainly many more than nine companion cards in your deck. It's just what happens to them when you play. Uh, for this deck, there's good reason to have a redundant number of copies. Uh, so that's basically it. We have a good mix here of like fellowship block cards, like Merry and Pippin, um, There and Back Again, Hobbit Appetite, Stout and Sturdy, Wizard is Never Late, Sam, Son of Hamfast, and then of Towers block cards. The Ents, of course, Boomed and Trumpeted, uh, Crack into Rubble, Escape. Even these Hobbit Swords are, I mean, I could pull first block versions of them, but these are from the second block. When you're building a Towers deck in like Towers standard format, again, you have access to now the Towers cards, series four, five, and six, but you can also go backwards and pull cards from series one, two, and three. So these cards, um, dot, 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 they're still very much legal uh, in this game. Now there is a literal Towers block format where you might only be able to use four, five, and six. In fact, you can only use four, five, and six because that's the point of that format. But, you know, that's a choice you make. This is Tower's Standard, series one through six. So on that note, let's take a look at the sites really quick. So these are all two Tower's block sites from series four, five, and six. When you're playing a Tower Standard game, all of the sites have to be from the two towers because that's the story that you're telling, is the story of the two towers. So we start in the plains and then walking through, you know, the, the wilderness of Rohan, we eventually make it to Edoras and then Theoden asks all the villagers to leave and start to go to Helm's Deep. And there we are in the Battle of Helm's Deep. This is the Deeping Wall, the Hornburg Armory, this feels a little chronologically out of order because this is where you would go to get ready for the fight and then this is where you would fight. Anyways, same thing here. This is a picture of like Thaden telling everyone to get ready. But I mean, geographically, the idea is that these are all Helm's Deep sites. Um, and then here is uh, Isengard, you know, Orthanc, as you get towards the end of the story and the Caverns of Isengard. Maybe that's a nod to the books because uh, the Battle of Helm's Deep is kind of over quick in the Two Towers, and then uh, the Fellowship sort of moves off to Isengard and confronts Sauron there. Uh, so things move quickly, and thus here you are with with that bit. Anyways, the the main point is this is all clearly Two Towers story. And quick note, you can tell what uh, block 
a site comes from by paying attention to the number in the corner here. This one has a tower above the number, so representing two towers. I think fellowship sites are unadorned, they're just a number plain. But then if you look at, say, a Return of the King site, so block three, then you get into this sort of thing. Uh, so it's like a king's crown. When you get into shadows and beyond, I think it looks different yet. I'd have to look at a, another one to say exactly what they look like. But yes, these are tower sites. And then here are the shadow cards for the same deck. We should add up to, no, we should add up to 37 cards here as we did with the Fellowship. So, Free People's cards are 37, Shadow cards are 37, and thus we have equal cards on both sides in the same deck. I'm looking and I don't think there are any cards here from block one. And that is okay. I'm certainly not required to have cards from series one through three, um, but I have access to them if I need them. Uh, there would probably be space if I wanted to, um, to include some of like the Realm of the Elf Lords, Isengard orcs in a deck like this, especially if I do want to use Sauron and like the, the site five that pulls him from the deck uh, because he gives orcs the chance to heal twice if the fellowship chooses to move on while he's out there so um they could build into the wounding strategy that this deck uses strategically i'm thinking this deck could use an overhaul i thought i had more orcs that discard orcs to wound people all i have is this guy right here and then a long game where i'm trying to play my one copy of wolves of isengard on a controlled site uh, but only these guys can control sites. I only have one copy of this. It's a little ugly. The, I mean, wargs work pretty well just on their own. They stick around, I think, for, like, both sites because they have so much vitality. Uh, so they discourage the Fellowship from moving on twice pretty easily. But all the same, there's some fine-tuning I'd like to do. Nevertheless, in terms of legality and deck building. We have like four copies of Wolf Voices, we have four Warg Masters, four Isengard Scout Troops, four Isengard Riders. Um, I might have included a fourth Foul Horde. I uh, probably don't own a fourth one, but that's all right. Um, yeah, I don't have too much to say about this otherwise. You'll see that this is all Isengard culture, and it's all like the idea of orcs, like warg riders. There's no rule specifying that it has to be all of one culture. You can mix as much as you want within your shadow side, as long as all your cards are shadow cards in the deck. But naturally, cultures are self-consistent. They support themselves. So it's efficient and effective to include as much of like the same core strategy in a deck as you can. So we have wargs in the deck, and then we have people who are, ride the wargs, and characters like the warg master who can play the mount from your discard pile, Sauron can help with that, Sharku exerts people as you do that. Um, you know, it, the strategy just rolls on itself. So I don't have too much to say about this side, but 37 cards, 37 cards in the fellowship, and this is a towers block Ents Wargmaster deck. So here's an example of a Return of the King deck. Uh, block 3, all of our sites should be from series 7, 8, or 10. I would imagine if there were sites in series 9, Reflections, they would be legal uh, in this block too. And specifically this is a deck that um, is like a Return of the King open format where we're using series 7, 8, and 10, but then backwards into like series 1 through 6 as well, uh, which you'll see in the cards um, for the Free Peoples and then the Shadows. But the sites still have to be from the Return of the King block. So here we are. And if you take a look in the corner, you can see 
the little crown there by the number, which gives us, you know, the idea that we're in Return of the King. It's hard to see here, but in the left corner, you can see collector's info, and it'll tell you specifically what number series the site is from, whether it's 7, 8, or 10. That can also help you confirm which block you're playing the sites from. So there's the sites for this. Uh, you see the Dunharrow Plateau here. Fellowship, spot a dwarf to play a dwarf condition from your draw deck, limit once per turn. So we are probably going to be looking at a dwarf in Fellowship. Yeah, let's take a look at that. So in my starting Fellowship, I have Gimli, Sindri, and now Bilbo. So in Series 9, you get your first alternate ring bearers. Bilbo kind of makes sense for the story because, of course, he was the ring bearer for a while. With this deck, I'm trying to emulate the, the story of the Hobbit. So it's Bilbo and the dwarves, and Gandalf will show up too. This isn't maybe as much of a deck building thing to notice as it is like a rule generally for like play, but Bilbo has a twilight cost of two in the corner here, and your starting fellowship can only be up to four. So we see Gimli two, Bilbo two, and Sindri two. Obviously that is not a total of four, but Alternate ring bearers, you don't include their twilight costs in the starting fellowship, uh, perhaps as though they are effectively zero. Um, so we're really just kind of looking at Gimli and Sindri as the starting fellowship. Um, and that's true whether you're using like Boromir or Isildur with three, or if you're using Gandalf with a twilight of four, there are alternate ring bearers, ring bearers for those characters too. And again, they're just freebies. So your ring bearer does not count against your total in your fellowship. Why have numbers? Well, because alternate ring bearers, while they have the option to bear the ring for you, you can choose to include them in your fellowships as a non-ring bearer and not give them the ring, in which case then they function according to their typical twilight cost. We could, for example, have Bilbo and Frodo in the starting fellowship with Frodo as the ring bearer and Bilbo just as a non-ring bearing companion, then Frodo would cost zero, but Bilbo would cost two. Anyways, again, this is the first opportunity, Return to the King block, because you get Reflections, Series 9, to use some other ring bearer. Then here's the rest of the deck, and it is a hodgepodge of various blocks uh, leading up to Return of the King. So here we have a card from Series 2. Here's that Series 4 Hobbit Sword. Here's some Series 1 Dwarven Axes. Mines of Moria Hand Axes. Here's a Two Towers Condition, Ever My Heart Rises. And then, yeah, a bunch of, like, first block Dwarven Skirmish events. Uh, four copies of that, four copies, three, four, one... And if we count our companions, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But not including Bilbo, our total free people's cards. Our total of free people's cards? I don't know how to phrase that. The number is 35. Um, Bilbo would be 36, but you don't include your ring bearer. So 35 cards total, which means our shadow will also need to be 35. I I feel a bit lazy that um, there's no Gandalf support in here. Like, it's just him. He doesn't have his staff or his sword or anything. Um, the the basic idea of this deck is try to go first at the risk of, you know, Bilbo being a, close to corruption because he only has eight resistance. But then you can use that Sight 1 to get Ever My Heart Rises from the deck and just get an early start on having a good Fellowship support uh, back there for yourself. Sindri can play events off of Dwarven Conditions. And then, yeah, this is just like a Dwarven Stomper, hopefully with the added advantage of getting cards out there a little bit earlier. And then hopefully we can draw into Sam too and get some burdens off of Bilbo quickly. So switching gears, here is a Fellowship Block deck. So all the cards are from Series 1 and 3. The shadow side of the deck we were just looking at uh, for the Return of the King block is a Sauron Swarm, 
And as you'd imagine, the number of shadow cards for that side of the deck is the same as the number of free people's cards. Looking at this one, there is a dwarf and elf mixture to the deck, and we're trying to take advantage of archery on the elven side with four copies of elven bow, leg loss, naturally being an archer, and then adding one if he spots a forest or a river, that is, if the fellowship is at a forest or a river, and then Aragorn possibly being able to contribute if you can draw into his bow. And then on the dwarven side of the deck, you have hand axes, dwarven axes, four and four, and then you have flurry of blows and axe strike. So it's trying to be the best of both worlds. Um, there are dangers to that and there are advantages. We do again have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten companions in there. Again, you can only have nine in your fellowship and in your dead pile at once, but that's okay because if we draw into our tenth companion, we can just discard him or her. We also have Thrarin here, who is an ally who allows himself to participate in archery, fire, and skirmishes. And allies, you don't have to worry about the number of them. They don't count towards the, um, the number of companions that you have out in play or in the dead pile. That being said, allies do go into the dead pile, but again, they don't count towards the total for anything. So not counting Frodo, this deck has 33 cards, but Frodo still counts towards the number of companions you have. Um, these are all, again, from series one through three, and we will take a look now at uh, the sites. Because this deck is from the Fellowship block, all of the sites on the Adventure Path are from Series 1 through 3. Specifically because we have this copy of Gimli and this copy of Legolas in the starting Fellowship, the sites are trying to take advantage as much as possible of being either underground for Gimli's text or being a river or a forest for the sake of Legolas's text. You actually want your opponent to go first so that without working too hard, you can play your own sites so that you get full advantage of Gimli's game text and Legolas's game text. For the sake of deck building purposes though, again, we're looking at sites which are pulled from the story of the Fellowship of the Ring specifically, and even more specifically from series one through three, the first three series that came out in the game. And then here's the shadow side for this deck, for the Elf Dwarf Fellowship Block deck. As we would expect, all of the cards are from series one through three. Um, in fact, they may just all be from series one through two, which is perfectly fine. Um, we only have four copies of any given card, four Yurik Ragers, four Yurik Soldiers, uh, four Yurik Scouts, four Yurik Warriors, uh, and then four Savagery to match their numbers, uh, three Yurik High Swords, two Red for Battle. So, um, this deck is angled towards Yurik High Awesomeness, for one thing. You know, everyone's damage plus one, there's opportunity for minions to become fierce, and then there's an angle in the deck with, like, the Yurik Soldier, the Yurik Rager, and the Yurik High Sword of attempting to discard cards from the top of the opponent's deck. This brings up something else, which we haven't talked about yet in this video. There are four copies in this deck of Savagery to match their numbers, and then two copies of Nertie. Uh, I don't know how you, how you would pronounce it. Um, Nertie, Enquie, Toldie. I, I imagine this sounds silly to uh, more than half of you. Anyways, this card and this card, they are both on the X list. The X list is a list of cards uh, that came out uh, for tournament play and for various formats to um, basically create a ban list. Uh, cards that couldn't be included in decks because they made the meta for the game too repetitive and stale. Savagery to match their numbers absolutely belongs on that list, 100%. Um, this says, make an uruk -hai strength plus two, or spot five companions uh, to make an uruk -hai strength plus four and fierce until the regroup phase. Notice that second line, um, 
not only makes them fierce into the regroup phase, but gives them the strength plus four bonus from the event in their fierce skirmish too. So it's like an event that works twice and gives the Urukai strength plus four while also making them fierce, doesn't cost an exertion, only costs zero. This card is cheap. Um, yes. So why is it in the deck if it's banned, if it's on the X list? So the decks I make are for, you know, playing with those who I might have the opportunity to play with. Of course, the game is no longer in print. Um, I'm not in any tournaments or the like. And in sort of the history of my playing in the game with family members, with family friends, we've basically taken uh, an anything goes sort of approach. Uh, honestly, this card has flown under the radar, um, but I've picked up on it recently and like, it's incredible. I definitely recall getting destroyed many a time uh, by my sister's Uruk High deck with Soromon, Keeper of Isengard, who um, makes all Uruk High fierce. Uh, the, the other thing for him is he exerts to prevent wounds to Uruk High, so he can protect them during the archery phase. So they're fierce and they're kind of invincible. And so fellowships just die. But we never said, okay, Sormon Keeper of Isengard is banned. Um, the point of all of this is whatever you, and again, your player group wants to do is what's important. It's good to know what's on the X list, and it's good to discuss that uh, as you're building decks for the people you're going to play with ahead of time so you're all on the same page. I will provide a link in the description for this video to the X list um, as described on the TCG wiki so you can see um, all the cards that are on there. This guy is another one on the X list. In my biased opinion, I don't know that Nertier needs to be. He says when you play Ularian Nertier for each companion over four, you may play one minion from your discard pile. That is powerful. Um, Obviously, he's in the deck, and I like him to be in the deck, but he's not, in this the context of this deck, obviously an Isengard minion. He's not going to get any support from your skirmish events, or from your weapons, or from any of your other minions, except for having other minions to fight with. So to get his game text, you're still going to have to pay for Twilight. Now, you get a minion for that, uh, 9 strength, 2 vitality, but he's not fierce, he's not even damage plus one. It's good to pull minions from the discard pile, but I don't know that Nerti is broken. However, you may uh, disagree. Cards like this, which can um, take minions from the discard pile at will, can obviously target exactly which minion you want to bring out. So there are probably dangerous circumstances for this minion in sort of machine decks that use like broken combos. Know that um, the X list is not a hard rule, but it does go hand in hand with formatting decisions. Uh, do you want to abide by the X list or not? So just to summarize again, uh, the X list is a feature that you can choose to pay attention to, and I think many, many people do. It may be a quirk of sort of our gaming history that we, we didn't really worry about that sort of thing at all. But I like playing with the cards that are out there uh, and giving them good use. And it is nice to run into some challenging situations and figure out how to work your way around them. It's also terribly frustrating to be destroyed by them too. I get it. Anyways, that's a discussion you want to have with your player group ahead of time, as I've mentioned. All right. Thank you all very much for watching. And if you have any questions, let me know.